All right, good morning, everybody. I see I haven't scared everybody off. Um, but today we're going to be reading from uh, The Divine Nature. So if you'd like to turn your Bibles, it's, it's printed on your paper for you, but if you'd like to turn to 2 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, you're sure welcome to. <clears throat> but I went ahead and I left up the diagram. Uh, we may refer to it a couple times, but uh, I just really enjoy that whole understanding. I added the words natural realm where the feet are, open heavens, and then, of course, uh, seated in Christ in the heavenly realms. Let's go ahead and stand, and let's worship the Lord this morning. Stand if you're able. If not, that's fine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Salvation purchased of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst on my sight. And angels descend. of mercy whispers of love well this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song I'm praising my savior has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by the evil desires for this very reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge, self-control, 
and to self-control, perseverance, and perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And if you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Jesus Christ and Savior. Thank you. So, Father, we thank you for this scripture. We thank you that you've put within us your divine nature. And as it says in verse 3, your divine nature has given us everything we need for a godly life. Not just some of the things, not just hope, but you've given us everything for a godly life. Lord, you've given us faith to believe in those things we can't see or hear. We thank you, Lord. And as we sing, this is our story, this is our song, God that you are the great provider of all the things that you've done for us. You are an amazing God. And I thank you, Lord, that we can participate in the divine nature and not be continually consumed by the natural realm. But you've placed within us that eternal peace that we are in Christ in the heavenly realms. I thank you for the joy of that, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, as we renew our mind, as it says, uh, possessing these qualities in increasing measure in verse 8. Renewing our minds, Lord, that when we do this, it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that you would continue to reveal your heart to them, reveal the eternal kingdom to them. For, Father, in these things, when we renew our mind in these things, we will be effective and productive for you. And as verse says, verse 10 says, when we do these things, we will never stumble. Father, I thank you for that promise that you've given us everything we need for a godly life, and that if we do these things, we will never stumble. Help us, Lord, to walk in those ways that you've pointed out here in 2 Peter. So we just turn to you right now. Father, I pray that each person here would be able to experience you this morning more than just knowledge, but hear your voice. So let's just take a little bit of time as we meditate on 2 Peter. Take some time. Give thanks to the Lord if that's where you're at for the divine nature He's put within you. Over the last two Sundays, we've gone in our imagination, the God encounter, the ascension prayer, to see Jesus in this room. So I just encourage you now to begin to praise Him for what He has done for us. I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that you'd continue to add to their faith goodness and knowledge. Self-control, Lord, where it seems like self-control gets out of place, I pray they'd be able to see you in them right now and be able to walk in self-control like they never have before. In the area of perseverance in life, I pray for your supernatural strength to persevere when our natural strength gives out. We just lean into you, Lord, that we may persevere. 
I thank you, Lord, that you put perseverance in this scripture because all the world is clamoring that there would not have to be any perseverance or trial. But, Father, you have made a way for us to walk in perseverance and also in godliness, Lord. Mutual affection and love. And Father, in love, we know that you've said love is an eternal thing and it won't pass away as the earth passes away. Father, we love how you love us. We love how you renew our mind. And we hold on to these things and we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name. Let's just take a little bit more time. Focusing on Jesus. And if any of these things uh, brought light to your heart, just begin to ask Him at this time what He would say to you concerning these things. Because remember, this divine power in us has given us everything we need. So if you feel lacking in any area, just begin to turn to Jesus and ask Him to renew your mind in the area that you can walk in Him in a godly life because He's given it to you. It's been freely given. Everything we need. And verse 10, don't forget that we, uh, we would never stumble. For those of you who the imagination is kind of uh, a struggle, and for everyone else, I feel like the Lord just began to speak to this room. He said, I love you. In his arms, I see his arms open wide. So, Father, we just receive your love for us. It's awesome. let them love on you for another short period of time and we'll move on help us Lord to meditate on you Thank you, Lord, that you are real, that your word is true. And thank you for giving us faith to believe in it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, everyone. So, as I have on the paper there, I'd like to um, talk about a couple things that uh, I didn't really know a lot about until I started studying scriptures about being in Christ. So there is a front and a back to this paper. I don't know if we'll get through it all, but I would like to get through uh, the f last one here on the front page and then, of course, the first one on the back. So there was a, a notion that was put to me that I would like to put to you. And this is the notion of if we have union in Christ, where can we say there is separation? And I began to look at songs I was singing. I began to look at things that I would say and hear. And I began to realize, well, if I say that, 
that means there's separation from Christ. So example one, we often talk about heavenly portals um, being a, a place right here where we see the power of Jesus. I still believe it, but I also believe at the same time that I can have a portal right here, but just as strong in my being because I live a dual reality in Christ, the dual reality being the natural realm where my feet are, and I'm also up in the heavenly realms all at the same time. So if I am living like this, according to Scripture, we are hidden with Christ in heavenly places. Another scripture says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. How can it be that we have to look for a portal? We have, the, we have this notion of Jacob's ladder. Angels ascending and descending, right? And I, I believe that. But at the same time, if this is also true, how can that be? So this is the way I handle these things. We have two things in tension. We have portals, and the other side we have our life living a dual reality. And when I first heard the term dual reality, I was like, that sounds kind of new agey. So if we have a better term for it, I will go for it. But in essence, there are two things going on. And I'm, the more I've been thinking about it, meditating on it before the Lord, the more I like this. Because there is no separation. I don't have to wait for a Jacob's ladder in my spirit to appear because I'm already connected. I don't have to wait for a portal somewhere uh, where portals have happened before in order to have this connection because it's already there. All right, everybody on, follow me on that. <clears throat> and so another uh, question, number two on there, a lot of times in the last number of years we've been talking about the seven mountains in the earth. Seven mountains, I do remember them all. We've got education, government. Uh, there are seven things that we've talked about in our society that we want to see God more involved in it, or uh, we want light, his light, to permeate those seven mountains. And then I began to realize we have Mount Zion in Christ. And Mount Zion is a mountain. So I thought... <clears throat> Mount Zion, according to actually, uh, someone turn to Isaiah 2 and read 2 through 3. It talks about the mountains of the Lord and how they compare to all the other mountains. Yeah, if anybody has it, Barb, you want to give them the microphone? If you're willing to read it when you have it, just raise your hand because I'd like to have it on tape. Yeah, so this is Isaiah 2. Two through three. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, did you want three also? Yes. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will not go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Amen. In the last days, that's where we're at right now. And it's comparing Mount Zion to all the other mountains. And it's really interesting how the seven mountains came to being. I don't know who coined all that, but I would just like to say my answer to the seven mountains is Mount Zion. Can we all agree? Now, Mount Zion has a lot of different uh, meanings. The Old Testament, there was actually a mountain. But Mount Zion, New Testament, has come to mean it is 
the presence of the Lord. We are in Mount Zion. And then, of course, we will get to uh, Hebrews 12, where it says, we have come to Mount Zion. And we'll talk about that another Sunday, but it's also right there. It's, it's a very, it's a scripture that has awakened my spirit to what is going on in this day and age. And then the third one, um, which <clears throat> uh, is very interesting to me, this whole notion of there being a thin wall between our reality and the reality of heaven. Going back to that concept of we are in this reality and God is in this reality. And if we just try hard enough or if we're lucky enough, we'll be able to get into the heavenly side of that veil. But what does this show us? There is no separation between us. Yes, uh, we could say, well, we're in the natural realm, so that's this side of the veil or that thin wall between us and the spirit. But I would like to say this. We've talked about that for many years, so I would put this forward. Let our minds be renewed that we are no longer separated by faith, brothers and sisters, we are in the heavenly realm. Because he blesses us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And I used to think it was now and it was then. Or if I can just be spiritual enough, then I can be in the heavenly realms. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are there now. Okay, so my point is this. We have union in Christ and we are no longer separated. Our brain and the world tries to convince us that that wall still exists. It doesn't exist. And you'll say, well, J.D., why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? We pray for people and they're not healed. You say, also, uh, the miraculous doesn't happen all the time. So I say this to you. We see in the world what is going on, but Scripture tells us something different. Scripture says that we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And I could choose to believe it or not, whether or not things are happening around me that I think are spiritual or not. But if the Bible says that I've just decided to trust the Bible rather than my reasoning. And that's where I'm at today. I didn't know. Did anybody have any questions on this whole notion of union with Christ versus separation? Uh, we just take a few minutes if there's any. If not, yeah, Barb. And then come here. I just know that um, being a facilitator of God encounters. Yes. That I have taken people through that don't even know who Jesus is. Okay. And they close their eyes, and I just ask them to find a safe place. And they find that safe place. And I said, are you there alone? And they said, no, there's a man in a white robe. Wow. And so that's how fast we enter into the heavenly realm. Right. So there is no separation. Come on. And I think it's getting, I mean, for me, I don't even have to close my eyes anymore and I can see Jesus. Um, and I, I am on this earth. I'm like that. I'm on, the, my feet are on the natural ground, but we have direct access all the time to the heavenly realm. It's, it, we're right. not separated from that. Right. And Barb, you lead a lot of God encounters and you spend time in God encounters and you would probably say every day. If yes. not, unless you're distracted. So it, it, what I have learned and what people are saying is the more you do it, the more you encounter in your imagination, God encounter, the eyes of your heart, the imagination, the more experiences you have. Um, and so if for some of you this is still like, I'm not getting it, it's okay. Because um, we're all our imagine uh, everyone's imagination is wired a little bit different. But the more for me, the more days I spend in a row 
the more these types of things become real. Can we go ahead and bring that up here to And that's uh, what uh, I was going to say too. It takes that spending time yeah. setting quietly before yeah. God and allowing And, and scripture him says meditate on these things daily. Yeah. Yeah, one right up here. Okay. If if on this uh, diagram you would at, at the waist level, let's say, you would draw a line. And this would be the thin wall. The thin wall right here, uh huh. Okay. When when Jesus um, sacrificially died. It split the curtain in the temple. Yes, it broke. It r tore the. It rendered rendered yeah. the veil. This curtain was thick. Yeah. And and it tore it in two, and it opened the way to heaven. Yes. That's when. That's when. Every believer can have this dual reality. Yes. At that point. And um, this, in all of human history, this is w was the biggie for God when Jesus died and was resurrected. That is the, the midpoint. Everything is downhill from there. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, we did, as humans, we did our worst. God did his best when that happened. And, and it opened the heavens to us. Exactly. At that point. It did. And Jesus said it would. Yes. And it has. And it's taken a long time for for the believers of Jesus to really get the revelation of what he had talked about. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. So, <coughs> thank you. Want to appreciate that. Anybody else? And then we'll go on to this next segment. I just keep thinking how much our terminology doesn't align with this because we've been or I have been brought up otherwise I mean it's come Lord Jesus well mm -hmm. um, or even and that that depicts separation right exactly. it's like God's there we're here so we say come Lord but scripture or even not to get on your case but what you said when that other gal you said that's how quickly we access the heavenly realms but if we're there we don't have to access it i mean our our terminology is just not wrapped up that way right we are there already and i find myself catching us like well i don't even believe that anymore <laughs> Very good. All right. So let's let's go on. There's a few more uh, other things to talk about this on the back of your paper. So I'll read John 14. This is 12 through 14. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. This is Jesus talking. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now see, my whole life, I would always focus on 14. Ask me anything in my name and I'll do it. And I totally didn't pay attention to, and they will do even greater things than these. Because Jesus did some amazing things. So when I had an aha moment on this scripture a year or two ago, I began to think about this. And Wednesday night, I would go at length, I'd say, what are the greater things? What are the greater things that Jesus could be talking about? 
So I just made a list of some things. I actually have a very extended list. Um, but there are things that have already been happening, not so much in our communities, but they happen. And I'll just go through this list and highlight a couple of them because to me, these are greater things. I, I, I still I, I can't always wrap my head around them. So number one, there's ascension, raptures, there's ecstasy. The heart is caught up and can't tell the difference. Like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 3. And number two, there's the transfiguration. Uh, we know the transfiguration of Christ. The Greek word is metamorpho. And the, the scriptures there in Matthew, Mark, Romans, and 2 Corinthians. There's the being translated. I think, Olga, you'd mentioned this last week. This whole notion of uh, being translated or transported, even levitation. Jesus demonstrated walking on water, teleportation, spirit travel. And a lot of, so what they're talking about, we see in Isaiah 6. We, uh, we see Philip in Acts 8. And Jesus in John 20, where the physical body changes locations. Like there was one time uh, uh, it said, they caught the fish and immediately they were on the shore. They were in the boat catching fish, and then the word says, and immediately they were on the shore. And I used to think, okay, they just wanted to abbreviate, and, and you know, they, we didn't want to hear about how they got to the shore. But that's actually not what the word says. The word says, and immediately they were on the shore. And so there's these, these little phrases that I would just pass over because I'd go, oh, yeah, Jesus can do whatever. But then I began to realize, hold it. If Jesus is doing these things, and he said we would do the things that he does, and even greater things, then why aren't we seeing it all the time? I don't have the answer to that question, but I think this is the beginning to understand it. This will help us begin to understand what is happening. <clears throat> on, and in, more on point three, history records over 200 accountings of levitation by the saints. I remember there was this one saint, and she would be so overwhelmed in the presence of the Lord, she would begin to float up. And she began to be embarrassed by it. And the accounting goes this. There was a group coming to visit this. I guess it was a monastery, or where were women? The men were in monasteries? Or I don't know. Anyway. We're coming to visit. And she knew that in the presence of the worship that was going to go on, she was going to levitate up to the ceiling. And so the account is this. She told her friends to come over and hold on to her so she wouldn't levitate in the presence. Now you're like, well, that's new age. And I'm like, no. That's the kingdom. And until we can begin to embrace the kingdom and what the world and New Age has stolen will never come to believe it. I was talking with Diane the other day, and it, I said, you know, it seems like Jesus has written a very unique thing into believers. And I, I don't know where the word is for this, and maybe you could say it, but it is this. If I choose to believe God, Jesus this way he will meet me in the way I have chosen I believe God will meet a Baptist where a Baptist believes I believe God will meet a charismatic where a charismatic believes I believe God will meet a Catholic where a Catholic believes if you don't believe in angels he probably won't send an angel to communicate with you but if you do believe in angels then he will probably communicate with you in an angelic way I mean, I, th I think most of us are there, but again, I'm open for discussion and input because I'm, my heart has been released and now I'm just trying to keep within, keep, keep within the flow of the faith 
and not get out of bounds. But as one friend that I always listen to, he says, if there's scripture for it, it's a safe place to walk. And then the last, uh, the number four, uh, ability to be ethereal or manifest in a different forms, multidimensional. Jesus, in Mark 16, 12, appeared in another form. And Jesus also was able to hide in plain sight. In John 8, 59, and 12, and 36, Jesus hid himself among the people. And I was like, oh, that's just a fancy way of God saying, he blinded the eyes so they couldn't see what Jesus was doing. But see, that's not what the scripture says. It just says, Jesus hid himself among the people. And I was like, oh, it could mean something different than just me taking my Americanized view of how we think it would probably work and superimposing that on the scripture. So I just put it before you. Perhaps we need to take away our Americanized view of the miraculous and how things work and take what the scripture says at face value. And number five, interactions with other heavenly beings, such as creatures that we see in Revelation, the elders that we see in Revelation, powers, principalities. I never even thought that I should even be wanting to think about these things until I began to realize, well, if I'm in heavenly places, why not? I I don't remember if I've told this story here in Sunday school or not. But last fall, I was doing an ascension prayer where I went up into the heavenly realms in my imagination, the eyes of my heart. And before me came this face. And the face actually looked like, uh, is it Van Gogh who had the, the, the face and he had the beard at the painting? So it kind of looked like that. And I was sitting there in in my prayer time, and I was like, well, that kind of looks like that painting, God. And I said, well, who is this? And I feel like the Lord said to me, this is Adam, as in Adam and Eve. And I was like, Adam? Okay, I don't know if I'm supposed to be seeing this or not, because maybe I'm cohorting with dead people, and you're not supposed to be thinking about dead people. But I thought, well, hold it. We're also talking about saints. So here we go. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go there. And I'll, uh, so I said very directly to Adam, I said, what's going on? What are you thinking about? And he said, well, I wanted you to know that I love, I loved and I still love gazing upon the tree of life. And I was like, hold, I was in my mind, I was like, hold it, hold it, hold it. But you messed <laughs> up over here. With the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what I was thinking, but I wasn't going to say it because I didn't want to ruin the moment. And so I just, I just had this time where we talked. And I was like, okay. It blew me away so much what I sensed him saying that I kind of had to, to stop. Because I was like, what? <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to me about a couple other things on that. But here's what I would say to you. When you press into being in the heavenlies rather than always thinking about the natural realm, be prepared because the Lord has many things for us that if we are open to it, he would. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, is there scripture for me seeing Adam? And I'm like, well, John the Revelator saw all kinds of things, creatures, saw elders, Jesus saw, or what was it, the transfiguration? I can't remember. I wasn't preparing to say this, but three people appeared, Elijah, Jesus, and Moses. It was Elijah. And so I'm thinking, well, hold it. Those dudes were dead. And it's recorded in Scripture. Game on. (laughs) I mean, I was like, okay, So this is being videoed, so I can't pause around too much. Okay, so in the last time we have remaining, 
I would really like to hear just your initial thoughts. Is this new to everyone? Have some of you been down this path before and you just want to make an anecdotal statement about something? Because th- I love these conversations. Anybody? Let's see. Want it? Let's see. Let's go. Let's go uh, right here. Uh, and yeah, and yeah, and then behind her. Well, I think for me, you know, because this is all new to me, and so when people keep talking about seeing God, uh. I was like, how do they do that? Because Barb talks about that a lot, and I'm like. How does that happen? How come I can't see God? Mm. But again, like you were talking about, Diane, seeing God, it's, it's not, like for me, it wasn't physically seeing God. Right. It was just being in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what was I was kind of spinning on seeing God. Right. And don't get me wrong. The sense of being in God's presence is very cool. Yeah. Even though you're not seeing something. That is, yeah. that's not bad. That's very cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. So last week, I told you and Diane, when I went up and I prayed, yes. I had my God encounter. Wow. And yes. it was so different than what I'd been hearing from everyone else. Because it wasn't, I was, I, I told you, I was see, I saw God, mm-hmm. but it was more of, I just felt like, even though I was surrounded by everyone here, that it was just me and God. Mm-hmm. That's, that was. Yeah, because you're scene. the one he loves. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, take it right behind her, Diane, to Olga. I just want to add to that, that yeah. though, that um, I've been doing classes for reading, and one of the things in reading comprehension is that you're supposed to visualize. And it's very interesting because I have some students who can't visualize what we're reading, even though the words might say the boy in the red shirt walked out to feed the fat pink pig or wh- whatever. They just can't visualize it. But the person who is extremely smart, extremely knowledgeable, amazing, remembers everything, the person who's in charge, who's instructing us, she said she cannot visualize. And she says she, un- she conceptualizes. And I thought that was re- really, so we've been talking a lot about yeah. that because she, I even emailed her and I said, can you picture your own kitchen? And s- Imagine standing at your stove and what's to your left, what's to your right. And she said she cannot. Right. She can conceptualize it. She knows what's to her right and left, but she cannot have a picture of it. So, I mean, you Right. Know. So as people come to God Encounters in this whole imagination piece, we're not all the same. We have all different experience, and it's okay. I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. It's just this is a way to continue to move forward. Yeah. Olga, go ahead. I believe that God has never, he doesn't have, it's endless what we can experience. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, I experience everything you talked about. It's the cloud of witness, the angels, they have a specific message, and then they appear, but I see them. I know them. I know who they are because they give me their names or I just know. Um, yes. When we had, I see him with my, because there is a seer gifting. There are different giftings, how we see and, and feel the presence of God. I see, and then there's a presence there. When Jesus comes, he comes in different times. I had to learn how he really looks like. At first, he would show me the crown, the thorn of crown, so I knew it was him. Okay. Then I saw him as a lion king. And a really, in the presence of God, when I see these pictures, my eyelids, they flutter. It's the presence is so strong. And sometimes I feel fire. Okay. Um, 
I hold back a lot of times. So sure. Then now I know him when he shows up. So when we were worshiping, we, we had few people in our house, and about six people, Miss Lonnie and me. We worshiped and we stopped, and we're just quiet, just like what you practice on Wednesday nights. And all of a sudden, Jesus appeared, and I could hardly breathe. I could, mm -hmm. the presence was so strong, there was so much fire. Mm -hmm. Everybody saw something, there was such a presence they saw him in a blue and circle like a whirlwind presence of God. I, I'm burning inside now. It is so real. People were touched. They had word of knowledge during that time that all fit together. And he wouldn't leave me. I could see in front of me, and I was there just saying what I saw. And he wouldn't leave till everybody else entered in. And everybody else had a word that we shared then with each other. Right. And there were people that they were so discouraged they wanted to g give up. Yes. And they were encouraged. They said, I'm glad we came. Right. The so present, we, I say it a lot, and it happens in God Encounters when you can be discouraged, but even though your discouragement isn't solved, being in God's presence. Yeah. That's it's it. it makes the discouragement grow strangely dim is another way to say it. Yeah, Jesus knew ahead of time how discouraged they were. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Barb. Well, just to clarify for you, Debbie, and, and others in here that don't understand that, I mean, we're taught in God Encounter training that well, not everybody's going to see him. Um, mm -hmm. You can, we always use the five senses. Um, you may see him, you may hear him, you may feel him. You know, most everybody has a peace that comes over them when, when they're in that position, but sometimes they don't see. And I think the scene, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but the scene comes the more you are in tune to the Lord, the more it becomes real. He knows what you can handle. And so he may not show up that way. Because for me, I saw him as a lion of Judah. I saw the father as a lion of Judah, standing up on a slab of rock. And he would let Jesus and I walk together down here, but he would never come down until I was comfortable with that. And so that's how... Yeah. how I experienced him in the beginning because I had such a fear of men. Yeah. Scott's been talking, Pastor Scott's been talking about this recently, and is this a God Encounter thing where you talk about your relational circuits? Yes. I've heard him use that a couple times now. That's a God Encounter thing where if you don't have your relational connections going, is that meaning to the Father or does that mean just to anybody? That means to God, your relational circuits? Well, I think, I think it has to do a lot with the trauma that people have been through. Okay, yeah, there's that trauma So piece you've got to get that out of the way. Uh, and sometimes God just comes and loves on them for maybe two or three sessions okay. before he ever does anything else. Okay. He just lets them feel his Right, love. so what you're saying, there's a process, and if anybody's interested in encountering God more than just the sensing God wants to encompass us completely all these different ways, and it, it becomes easier the more you practice it. Yes. Very good. All right. Uh, do we have one more comment before uh, John? Let's bring up John, and then we'll dismiss. <coughs> so I am... Um, the part where you're talking about how God meets people wherever they are, like it doesn't matter what faith they are is they're Baptist or Catholic or whatever so I would go a little further than that and say that I used to put God in a box a, a little bit so I would I didn't believe in a lot of the healing stuff for today and whenever James Maloney came I used to always call him James Baloney because I thought it was fake I thought it was wow. real and I never really wow. saw anybody from our church get healed always people that I didn't know that were mysteriously getting healed so I'm like 
well, did he just bring those people here? Mm. You know, how, the, how does right. it work? So I didn't believe that right. stuff for, really. So, and then another example, and then Dave Duell came to our church. I don't know if y'all, anybody remembers Dave Duell, but he said he was in um, um, Sunday school and he, he showed us and he had me hold the chair. And I don't know why he picked me, but he did. I, I was holding the chair. He never touched a person. And, the, and when, he, when that person got touched by God and healed, I don't remember who it was, but the chair, I was holding it, trying to keep it from moving, and I slid back with the chair about 10 feet. And he never touched them. Wow. And, I, and that changed my view on that. So I don't think it always has to do with what you believe. I think sometimes it has to do with what you don't believe, and God will meet you there too kind of like angels that's good i didn't believe in angels very much until i encountered my my guardian angel right. so there you go i believe in angels now so i think yeah. that god can can reach you in what you believe or in what you don't believe i don't i think we guys take that whole thing off and say god can god can meet you wherever you are and even where you're not <laughs> amen so. amen so with that father i thank you for today i thank you that you have made a way i thank you that we can encounter you this side of the cross. It's amazing. I thank you for that gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.